Social media used to be a place of freedom and openness. But today the reality looks different. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility and that was a big mistake. We weren't expecting any of this when we created Twitter over 12 years ago. My kids like a junkie. Ultimately there's one person that is in charge of what people see or don't see. It's very hard to leave Instagram, it's very hard to leave Twitter. Every day, more than two billion people use a social media app called TikTok. The business model is to addict you. That's not by accident, that's a design technique. Social media is broken. I wanted to find out if there's a solution to all of those problems. During my research, I found a new technology called Noster. Influential figures such as the Twitter founder, Edward Snowden, as well as some of the brightest minds in social media, all say that this might be the future of social media. This is why I'm traveling right now to Costa Rica to meet with the guys working to solve all of those problems. I wanted to find out what all the hype is about. And you won't believe what I found out. Thousands of people are working on this technology because all of them believe we need to fix social media. This might be the first time that you hear about this invention, but it has the potential to set the world free again. Let me introduce you to Noster. In order to fully understand the significance of this new technology, we need to have a deeper look at the early days of social media. And who would be better to talk about that than the two masterminds behind Twitter? Uh, I'm Ravel, I was the first employee, architect, lead engineer, de facto CTO of this company, Odeo. We are most famous because we pivoted from doing podcasting to building a text-based social network called Twitter. Jack Dorsey co-founded Twitter in 2006, when he and a few pals started sending messages to each other. Uh, I'm Jack. That's all. <laughs> so, how did the early days look like? Late 80s and early 90s, with the emergence of the web, it was like everything is possible. It was so exciting because we were doing the things for the first time they've ever been done. The internet created the ability to share data in real time from anywhere in the world. Like you had no idea who these people were, where they were around the world, and it was just a very magic but also weird time. The initial idea of the internet was that everybody can build whatever they want on this technology. And there was a reason for this. The internet was started because people agreed upon ways of communicating with each other, which was a protocol. The internet uses protocols to send data from place A to place B. Imagine them like streets on which your data is being transported. The email is one of the most famous examples. So if you send a message, it travels this street or protocol until it arrives at your friend's destination. We have apps like Gmail, for example, who are able to interact and translate everything that's happening on the protocol layer for us to see in a nice layout. The beauty of email is that this protocol is open for anybody to build an app on this. And this is the reason why we not only have one email company, we have thousands. And in the beginning of the internet, almost everything was structured like this as an open protocol. I think the first problem that a lot of these early internet companies solved was the discovery problem. You have to understand that back in the days, everything was super chaotic. You didn't just find the information like you want because there was no way to interact with all of this data on the protocol. A video didn't get viral because it was on YouTube and the algorithm pushed it. No, people sent it to their friends via email or in forums. There was no way to simply Google it or find it in any way. The protocols were full of data and information which no one knew how to organize yet. The internet was almost entirely decentralized, so finding something and bringing all these things together was, was challenging. And this is how the first successful internet companies evolved. They found a way to organize this data. Google with organizing the world's information. Then you had things like Facebook and of course Twitter and MySpace. All of those companies focused on one specific task in organizing this information, be it news, friends or knowledge. Twitter focused on sharing short messages, which actually is not that innovative. Like Twitter's magic was not that it was an innovative company. Twitter's magic was 
that it was a company that created an innovative ecosystem. The innovative thing about Twitter was that the code was open source, similar to the email. Anybody who wanted can look at the code and add their own code on top of this. Yeah, so if you wanted to build something inside Twitter, the company, you needed consensus and everything else. If you wanted to just use Twitter and build something outside, you didn't. And so all the innovation happened on the outside. The word tweet, using the at for a username, hashtags, real-time search, trending topics, short links, inline images, inline video, everything that we think of as Twitter, except the 140 characters come from the third parties, from the developers. And this is what open protocols enable. Anybody can help to innovate and build different products on top of this. But back in the days, those open protocols have also been quite inefficient. One of the things that really creates new products, new companies, and people pay for is to save time. And this is why social media companies decided to just take the data and put it into their own database. Of course, this was way more efficient, but back in the days, no one was able to see what consequences this would have. And the web just kind of blew up, and it turned uh, into these destinations that you could go to that allowed you to discover things and people much faster. But the problem was it centralized them into a company. Any, any business to have data, the data is held in their database. And so that means you have these natural monopolies forming around data. So a Facebook, once you're on the platform, you're stuck on the platform. It's a walled garden because they're the only ones that have access to that data. And this is the reason why every social media today is centralized. Those companies aggregate the information and keep them for themselves. There is no openness anymore. You went to them to discover content, and now it's the only way you can discover content. And because they are now in this position, they use the power against us. We got really used to um, not paying for things. We got really used to basically free products, and you never had to pay to have an account, you never had to pay to have the product. And these companies raised a lot of funding, which was used to support the growth of the company at the start and create a really great product at the start for everyone. There was no way to get that money without going to a particular kind of venture capital. And then at some point, investors, rightly so, were like, well, we need to make money from our investment. And so then it's like, well, we can either charge people to use it, which is very difficult if people are really used to not paying for something, or we can find another way to basically provide returns to our investors. And that way became advertising. And this is the point where the social media companies turned against their own users. That way became then controlling your feed to maximize the amount of time that you're spending on the app. So this making it really, really addictive, the infinite scroll. All of this just to keep you on the platform to sell your time to advertisers. They have to do whatever it takes to maximize revenue, maximize profit. No matter what they say, that is their goal. It's not necessarily about who they're serving. And so how can they get you to spend as much of your time as possible on the app? It's very hard to leave Instagram. It's very hard to leave TikTok. It's very hard to leave Twitter. You're being subtly manipulated by algorithms that are watching everything you do constantly and then sending you changes in your media feed that are calculated to adjust you slightly to the liking of some unseen advertiser. What you're seeing is in the hands of these companies that help you discover it. Did you know that Facebook convinced all of the media companies to switch to using video instead of text? by lying about the viewer numbers on videos on Facebook. So they'd be like, I want the Washington Post to make videos instead of articles because it's better to sell ads. So I'm gonna say your text post got 10% of the views and your videos got 20 times more views. They lied. They fucking lied. Social media used to be open and fun, but today it's controlled by greedy companies. We actually forgot about the openness of the early internet and are facing incentive structures which are simply wrong. And this is the root cause of why you feel miserable when using social media. Because social media is no longer about giving you value. In order to keep their business running, social media companies need to keep you addicted and outraged. So they can then sell your time to their advertisers. 
Elon Musk was the breaking point. Like the fact that he was able to take over Twitter, claiming that he was going to make it open. Like if you look at his claims, he's going to open source it, open source the algorithm, build it on an open protocol, support all this stuff, make it super free speech friendly. And, and now he's banning journalists for life for insulting him. In general, there is so much censorship going on now, I think as a result of the last couple of years, that is very concerning. Now, everything that you just saw allows social media companies to censor whatever information they want. And this makes them extremely powerful. Even though we don't have an authoritarian regime, if you have platforms which are effectively shadow banning people or outright banning people because of what they say, and you have the major means of communication are through these basically for-profit centralized platforms, then what happens is the information you receive begins to look very similar to the information you receive in a dictatorship such as China. Except that rather than the central government determining who gets to say what, it's a for-profit platform. This censorship problem might not be that obvious because we are normal people, right? We won't get censored. Generally speaking, I, I don't think I'm a bad guy. I don't think I do anything that's wrong. It took me a while to realize that it's not about what I feel about myself. It's not if I feel that I'm a good guy or a bad guy. It matters what somebody else thinks and who's controlling that platform. The degree to which uh, various government agencies had effectively had full access to everything that was going on on Twitter uh, blew my mind. Um, I was not aware of that. Would that include people's DMs? Uh, yes. Ultimately, there's one person that is in charge of what people see or don't see, what they react to, how they can contribute or not. I can think that I'm, nothing I'm doing is wrong, but that doesn't matter, it's what they think because I'm using the platform. So that centralized power doesn't really speak to the nature of, I think, what the internet wants to be, which is there are no single deciders. There's no single point of failure. There's no one person that's on the hook for all these decisions of millions, if not billions of people. If this is our public spaces, this is how we communicate with our friends and our family and where we do business and everything else, then we need to not just own our content, because the content doesn't matter so much. You can download your content from Instagram, but you lose your connections. Those connections, those social connections of who's following whom, how they're connected, who can see whom, what algorithms they use, those are things that people need to control themselves. Imagine if we didn't have a protocol for email, but you had to go to a company like email.com, and if they didn't like the email you sent, they would just like prevent you from sending an email. That would be disastrous for the corporate world because now you don't be worrying about censoring yourself or they can monitor you know all the corporations communications and so when you look at the social media it's like why do we entrust it all in like one corporation for all of our communications that are like just talking to your friend and this just blew my mind because the tech we're using for social media is just wrong right now the majority of social communication happens over websites that protocol that websites use was not designed specifically for that. So I don't think any amount of tweaking can uh, fully heal it. At Twitter, I realized a bunch of our issues being a centralized company and what that meant for what we were trying to build and our purpose, which was to serve the public conversation. We can't truly serve the public conversation as a corporation. We can help, but we can't be the only thing. And the reason why is we and I at that time, could be called to Congress. We could be compelled by the governments around the world to take down content that they don't agree with, but is perfectly reasonable outside of uh, state lines. We could have employees that make decisions on themselves because we don't have the right checkpoints. We could have me, who might have a bias, make decisions that inform one direction or not. All those things are, are single points of failures and, and ultimately failures, so as I was really understanding that brought me back to why I love the internet and why I love the early internet in particular and why I love the protocol aspects of the internet. And the reason why I decided to start funding a protocol for social media because it didn't have one. And this is the key here. 
Social media didn't have a protocol yet because it worked over websites. And you can't open source those. The companies running those websites own the data and can decide whatever they want to do with it. But now we have better technology where we can decentralize the discovery problem a little bit more. And we don't have to be reliant upon a particular company or one organization to help us navigate the internet. Like we have really good machine learning. We have really good decentralized tech that didn't exist. We have really good cryptography that didn't exist. There's tons of research in all this stuff and that didn't exist before. So the new protocol that Jack talked about is called Noster. And the main intention with this is to try to decentralize the fixed structures of social media. Because this then would allow the users to have more control over their data and also reduce the power of the large social media companies. So how does Nostra do that? So imagine if Twitter, rather than all the information being stored on our Twitter database and the only way I can access people's tweets is via Twitter. Imagine that information is stored in a distributed way and now anyone can build an app that gets the same tweets. It's a little bit like the email. We have this layer where all the information, posts, text and everything is stored. But this data isn't connected to one specific social media platform. No, anybody can build a social media platform which accesses all of this information. Elon always talks about, oh, we're going to open source the algorithm. It's like, well, that doesn't really, that okay, now we understand how it works, but I st I'm still forced to use that algorithm. Well, the real, the real solution is to let the user choose the algorithm and let the user turn off the algorithm. I, I can't build a client for Twitter because they control the language and, I, and I'm, I'm not allowed to build, build that. But with, when you're building on a protocol, the client, anyone can build a client. So we, right now in Austria, we have 20 clients, probably 30, 40. Say I think people shouldn't drink coffee. On my platform that I build, I'm not going to let you see any posts about coffee because I think coffee should be banned. The information about coffee or the pictures are not being deleted. It's just that this one particular app doesn't showcase it to their users. That would be relatively known. Like, it would be obvious I'm not getting posts about coffee. Someone would say, have you banned coffee? And it would become quite obvious. My friend Sarah, she's like, well, I think people should drink coffee. So she can just go and build another app, access all the same information and provide all of that information, including the coffee. So now you understand how everything works, but this is happening in the background, right? All of those algorithms, you don't see that. But the interesting thing about Noster is that the layout of the apps can also be completely different, which allows you to see the same information of your friends in different layouts. So let me show you an example. So this app looks like Twitter, right? We have pictures being posted, but also text. But I can see the same content on another app. Let's look into it. This app looks more like Instagram. And as you can see, it's the same post. I just see the pictures of my friends, of course, like in Instagram, but I see the same steak, as you can see here. And I also see the same dog. So it's really up to me how I want to see this because Nostra is a toolkit where the apps can decide themselves what data they want to pull from the protocol and then how they want to display it to me, the user. So all of the social platforms now, the business model is get data, give ads, get money for ads. Very basic. And the business model, that's just not going to work anymore. What you're going to have to do is actually build a platform that people love and they actually just want to come to every day because they love it. Because if you stop providing that value to a customer or to a person, someone else is going to come in and do something better. So we move back to providing the social media user with the best experience possible. It's happened in the old world, this company like Twitter, it's got to where it is, it has a monopoly position, it's stopped innovating. It just is what it is, it's not changing. Whereas now companies are going to have to keep innovating and they're going to have to keep providing ways of providing value to a consumer, to a person, to a customer in order to get a little bit of value in return. Because if I don't like what the app does, I can simply switch to another app. I choose one, I log in, and then I have the same setup, the same content, the same friends, just provided by a different app. With Noster, with these open protocols, we're once again given license and ability to play again. We're not users, we're not consumers. We're co-creators in this. And that's super exciting. 
built by us for us. It's the users that are building the community. It's the users that are providing the feedback. Because it is an open protocol, everybody can access it and basically build their own social media. You know, I was talking to this guy who's running a gay, p like hardcore gay p relay. Uh, there's other people who are running relays for their church groups. And there's other people who are running relays for like hardcore Bitcoiner folks. A diverse internet, a diverse ecosystem lets all of those things exist. All of this data, including your connections, pictures and messages, are stored in this open protocol. And this is why it's so revolutionary, because you control your own data. If you've never been censored, if you've never been moderated, if you've never lived under an oppressive regime, then these features don't resonate with you. But if you think outside of your privilege and you think about the other eight billion people in the world and where they might live and what they might be experiencing, it'll start to click. You'll start to realize that Noster is really powerful for other people on the planet, not just me. But the cool thing is that Noster is not only about social media. This open protocol can be used for way more use cases. Noster at its basic level is just text communications. So you can use it to push around messages. You can use it to push authentication. And if we think about it, messaging and communication is the base layer for all services. It's the base layer for Uber. It's the base layer for LinkedIn. It's the base layer for Yelp. Being able to build on this means that I have no idea what it's going to be. And that's the most amazing thing. I'm not setting the direction. I can have opinions, but my opinions don't matter unless I build something. All these apps that we use today on our phones to do reviews and request services, anything really could be built on top of Noster. With an open protocol with open source, you don't ask permission. You build. If you have an idea, you just build it. And if the market finds it and they love it and they use it, then it becomes big, it becomes a thing. And, and to me, that's natural. Even though right now the majority of use cases on Noster is basically like a Twitter replacement, that's not as exciting as what will come. The things that people are now just starting to think about and now just starting to work on will be the cool things in the future. So now I hope you understand why Noster is such a big deal. But I also wanted to know why all of those people are doing this. You know, I think it's a safe assumption to make that every single person on this planet will eventually be connected or one degree away from connection to the internet. Probably one of the most important things that we do to stay connected to, to really advance humanity. You know, if we're all on this planet together, we're all facing eventually the same issues. If a meteor comes and strikes the earth, we're all in it. <laughs> the, the borders and the boundaries aren't going to matter as much anymore. World War III happens, nuclear war, we're all in it. None of those borders are going to matter anymore. So the internet represents that. I, I think a lot of the energy we're seeing today is re-recognizing that and making sure that those borders don't get solidified into corporate or state norms that we can't go over. 20 years ago, you couldn't make your own TV show. You need to ask for a gatekeeper. You need to ask for someone who has a television channel or a cable network to do it. You couldn't make your own radio program and have anyone listen to it without some radio station and distribution company saying yeah. I hope that more and more people find that. I hope more and more people stop asking for permission, just build what they want. We're democratizing things. We're transforming things. This thing has moved so fast, faster than any other thing I've been a part of. So it's been really amazing. That I can be here on this YouTube channel talking to people is unimaginable 20 years ago. And we can't imagine what we'll be able to do in 20 years. But we only get to do it if we do it together. And that's the exciting part about, you know, designing the future. If you now want to join Noster, you can find everything you need down in the description. This has been a long and challenging journey for me, and I have something special for you at the end of the video. 
But I'm an independent filmmaker. I self-funded this documentary and poured my heart and soul into it. I hope you saw that. <laughs> From the animator's work to the equipment costs, every aspect of this documentary was actually self-funded. And if you liked the video, I would be so grateful if you could consider making a donation. Any amount you can contribute, no matter how small, will help me to fund my next project. You can do so easily by sending Bitcoin here or when you want to send me normal money, you can find a link in the description as well. I also want to give a special shout out to the Geyser Fund because they helped me with a value for value contribution which actually covered some of the costs for creating this film. So thank you for watching this video, I hope you liked it. Don't forget to subscribe and like this video down below and I'm gonna see you in the next video. Bye bye.